Hey guys, it is Jim. So this handsome devil is Philip Earl Johnson, a.k.a. Gene Shepard, a.k.a. the narrator in A Christmas Story, the musical. So congratulations, man. Like Thanks. it's, you know, we talked really briefly at opening night, and now, yeah. you know, we've had a, another week in uh, performance underneath. And it, the show keeps, people don't realize, like, the show keeps evolving even after opening night. It's, sure. It's different and stronger and, you know, all sorts of different elements, right, to it? Well, yeah. And I mean, when you're doing something over and over and over again, and, you know, I've done a lot of things for many years, like the same thing over and over and over again, I'm always looking for nuances and ways to finesse a line to to hit it or, or it also being more aware of, how each line could potentially land differently based upon how it's going that night. So it isn't the same every night. It has to be organic and rich for that particular night and, and as it's evolving. So it's not just evolving into a thing that it wants to be just always itself. It's different every night. Now, you've been doing what you've been doing for a long time, man. You went to Illinois State, and you got a theater degree down there. A BS in theater. Yep. Right. And then you came up, and you've worked all over the place. You know, it's you have these many different kind of facets to your career. You worked at the Goodman and Ryder, Chicago Shakes, Court, Steppenwolf, the list goes on. And then this is really like your second or third musical second. that you've done. Second musical. Second over, yeah, ever. And a huge one to jump into on top of that. Uh, yeah, man. it's a thrill. It's a thrill. I mean, I've been in big shows before. I was in a national tour of Angels in America. Uh, so we were playing in 3,000 seat theaters uh, on that tour. Uh, but this is the first time I've been in a musical and having that big of a crowd every single night. Sometimes in that tour we were at 500, sometimes we were at 3,000. So every night to have that many people, it's a, it's a hoot. And I gotta ask, so is there a different approach and preparation to going and taking on a musical? And obviously this is, uh, there's really warm and touching scenes and it's, you know, you kind of narrating your life uh, as opposed to some of the other stuff that you've done in the more dramatic side of things. But taking that for granted, just a general approach to a musical versus a straight play. Well, it was definitely a different process because in a musical, as I'm learning, it's about let's fix the song, let's fix the, fix the dance. The acting, that'll work itself out, uh, but we've got to make sure that this dance happens at the right time and then with the music and bam, 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 bam. And just think of it in, in the terms of like a forest fire. Like we've got a big forest fire in Montana. We got a big forest fire in New Mexico. We got a big forest fire in Utah. We got a little tiny one over in Arkansas. Now I'm in Arkansas because <laughs> I don't have any songs, okay? So we'll get to you, but I'm a small fire because you know, like, oh, that'll work itself out. So um, you learn that there are priorities. Whereas in a play, we're working through this, we're asking questions like, like hmm, what do you think? I don't know. What do you think? Ah, <laughs> ah, let's think about that. Okay. And then we move on. So right. like, but here it's like, no, it's this, it's this, it's this, fix it. Oh, that's not right. Okay, fix it. Boom, boom. So it's a constant process of fixing it. So it's fixed better, fixed better, fixed better. Whereas we don't fix it in a regular play. We just create it. It, it, it evolves and then when it opens, that's what it is. Right. So. The other thing you've done, and you've done some really cool stuff with, uh, you know, TV and movies, Chicago Med, which is recent. You've been on Chicago yeah. Fire, J and Dharma and Greg, movies like, you know, Out of Towners, Missing Persons, et cetera, which is, again, is a totally different ballgame than doing a theater, right? I mean, the whole yeah. approach to it and, and really no rehearsals. You just jump up there and yeah. the hurry up and wait, all the things that go into that, too, right? It's a t totally different medium, but it's still all acting. I right. mean, you know, it's all... Just like an audition is acting. I look at auditions now as a chance to act. So I love to act. That's all I ever really wanted to do. Odd that I became a clown. But yes, I, uh, I, all I ever really wanted to do was act. So whether I'm acting for the camera, and actually you're not alone. There's a big crew. So the crew is all, and they're all watched. They're all focused. It's all through the, this small lens. But everybody's in the room, and they're all paying attention. So there is performance that's involved, even in television and film, even though it's very small. And you just referenced uh, being a clown. So the other part of your career, which is the much more lighthearted part, is you as 
Mooney the Magnificent that people know you from, not just the Renaissance Fair up here in uh, Bristol, Wisconsin, yeah. but all over the country. Yeah. And uh, I love it. You've got a really cool website, and I tell people to go check it out. It's philipearl.com. And when you get to that homepage, it says juggler, rope walker, foolish mortal. Yeah. And then you have all these different aspects to it, including uh, I played rock, scissors, paper on there today with you. But so tell us about the Renaissance Fair and how you got involved in that. Cause According to a couple of things I've read, you've done like well over 6,000 performances as, yeah. you know, you said a clown, but as, you know, a performer in that instance. I got involved in it when I was 17. I started doing Renaissance Fairs and then time went on and I had, a, um, I was doing a different show out there and uh, the guy who was the artistic director of this one festival said I should have my own show. His name's John Mills. Um, he's a local producer in town. And he said I should have my own show. I said, I don't have a show. He said, well, you just go out and learn. And I started and and I started learning just by failing. And I, I went to a, a comedy convention. The guy said, the first 200 shows, you're not going to be good. You're going to suck. And then it's after that, it's going to start taking shape. And he was about right. And so it's really just been a, a matter of trial and error. Like, I just picked the things that I liked to do, or I thought that I might like to do, like to walking on a tightrope, uh, juggling, all kinds of different object manipulation. But it's and stuff really, that is on fire from the video I've seen, oh, too. Yeah, yes. fire, fire juggling, fire eating, all that kind of stuff. I would think you stuff. don't want to suck at the fire juggling and eating the first couple of times. No, you'd rather probably, blow. Right, you'd rather yeah. blow than suck. <laughs> <laughs> in the fire eating department, definitely. Yeah, you know, you just, it's just a matter of like finding what you love and then throwing it out there. And I'm, I'm fierce, like in my show, like there's a lot of audience participation. I got 600 people, and it's them against me, and I'm gonna make it happen. And it is gonna, it is gonna happen. And I think I can get really intense in my show, even though it's uh, meant to be a funny show. There's, I'm, I consider myself the, the king of discomfort. I am, I can out discomfort a whole room full of people. Wow. I, and I will stand there and I will make it be, if, if it's not happening the way I feel it should be happening, as far as like everyone investing, everyone putting in, it is all together, all for one, one for all. And if that's not happening, we're gonna make that happen. If you don't like it, one monkey come, one monkey go. You can go, you can say no one, no one has nailed you to the seat. So. And, and that can be controversial a little bit, but my show has been ranked number one in the country out of hundreds of Renaissance fairs uh, for four years in a row. So it's sort of like Don Rickles. You know, you, you, if, if you are willing to be real, people will respond to the truth more than they respond to nice. They respond to the truth, and, and that's what I try to do. I try to give them the truth every single time, and sometimes the truth isn't pretty. So... When it's all said and done, is it that Renaissance Fair that you enjoy the most, given that immediate, I mean, it's really the immediate, and it's you kind of doing a, a one-man show nonstop, it is. It you is. know. over and over, yeah. same thing. No, I, I love acting. I was born in, to be an actor in my heart and in my spirit, and that's what I love to do the most. I've got a lot of kids. I've got four kids and a mortgage, and <laughs> uh, I am... I am highly overcompensated for my work at the Renaissance Fairs. So I do that because it buys health insurance and yeah. it buys um, a, a house and private education for my kids. But um, that's not to say I don't love it. I do love it. But it only, I would say, I always say it satisfies about 80%. Acting is 100% because it, is about life and, and life. And usually the plays I do are really serious plays. I usually do plays about death, pain, and dying. And, and, and this is not, they let me out of the corner, the dark corner to do a play about love and joy. I, ironically, I'm a clown and they never let me do comedies, but I'm getting a lot of laughs here. So that's kind of nice. Um, I, I, I just think life is richer and more full than just getting laugh, 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 laugh. And I can get the laughs anytime. That's not a problem. It's just I like a more fuller, richer experience in creating a full life rather than just a segment of it. Well, look, you create this full life eight nights a week here at the Paramount, and everybody's eating it up and loving it. And, and uh, as I was uh, talking to Michael earlier, like just listening to it and the narration and that very ending scene, and especially you talking about the reason that you like the BB gun is such, as the kid, is so touching because it came from dad. And I get teary every time I hear that because I'm like, it's such a beautiful sentiment about all that. I and do you do too. it beautifully. I, because I get teary-eyed too every single time. Yeah, it's, man. It's, it, how can it not resonate, you right. know, especially for, uh, and, uh, you know, a man in America or anywhere, you know, yeah. you know, maybe you, moms too, but for dad, there's just a little something loaded in there, right? Right. 
Well, look, it's nothing but a joy to have you here. We're glad Thanks. you're a part of this family. Me too. And, and it's been fun to get to hang out with you. So thank you for taking the time, too, man. you got a show tonight. Yeah. you got to be tired, and I know you got to get ready to go again. So thank you. And come see Philip Earl Johnson. And look, check him out and check out his website. It is philiperl.com. It's absolutely awesome. Look for him uh, this summer also at the Renaissance Fair. And then hopefully back here again sometime with us at the Parrot, man. Let's thank hope. So i got to take some singing lessons. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Thanks Phil. Thanks a lot. <laughs>